Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I also like to thank the uh, conveners of the conference, uh, my friend and colleagues, uh, Professor Rahim Shaigan and Professor Robert Rollinger. And I'd like to thank Marissa for putting up with me after sending uh, tens of emails during the past months, as well as very nice to meet uh, Lexi Henning and thank her for her uh, help. Let's see, I'm doing this right. Okay, uh, let me begin. Persepolis or Parse was a monumental Persian project which represented a move from the Tispit center, Pasar Gade, to the seat of power for Darius and his Achaemenid Empire. The attachment to this ceremonial center of the Persian people seemed to have been so important uh, in that successive kings continued building upon Darius's project and placed their mark onto Persepolis in writing. In effect, Persepolis was the face of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, built by the many people and by Darius's Xerxes and the Artaxerxeses for the next two centuries. While we do not find the exact wording at Persepolis, and this is most curious, uh, but at Darius's uh, Susa Palace, we know that the Persian king explained his work some several times in his inscription as building something wonderful or perfect, frasha. Uh, so bringing the sense of uh, the term that has eschatological meaning into a physical space. This attention an attempt at perfection, I would say, at Persepolis, appeared to be a long-term project and continued uh, almost to the end of the life of the empire. When Artaxerxes III, sorry, I'm one slide behind it, you see. Now you see the Susa and the uh, uh, Persepolis uh, monuments next to each other. And so uh, when Artaxerxes III in the fourth century BCE placed the stone stairways at the palace and made a point to remind those who come after him of his endeavor and beseech the gods to protect Persepolis, as you can see. And the gods are here, um, Ahura Mazda and the god Mithra. Uh, only eight years after the passing of, of Artaxerxes, Persepolis was burned by Alexander of Macedon as either revenge for the Persian aggressions of Athens uh, uh, some 150 years ago. Otherwise, it may have been a party gone out of hand, which resulted in the burning of part of the palace. But if Alexander was more calculating, the destruction of Persepolis symbolically extinguished Persian resistance and its ceremonial center of the empire came to an end. Ali Musavi has already given the most detailed study and observation on the life and importance of Persepolis, or Parse, after its burning and sacking by Alexander. For what is worth, I would like to add a few more observations as to the importance of Persepolis for Persian history and identity in the pre-Islamic times. At the outset, we should ask, does invasions and incursions into the heart of a civilization invoke, create, or reorient the identity of its people? It has been suggested that Persian incursions into Elas or Greece brought about a new sense of identity and togetherness and a response among the Greek city-states. The question that could be posed here is that the Greek Greco-Macedonian incursions into Persis create or reorient a sense of identity? And how could Persepolis as a monument would have contributed to such a vision? Time may alter the history of the past, especially in the absence of a continuous textual tradition. But what about structures and monuments? How do buildings keep memory? Can we think of Persepolis as a site of memory, as an enduring physical place where the past is remembered and commemorated? That is to consider Persepolis as a physical place, as a container of memory, or what has been called memorialization. 
What I'm asking is that how could Persepolis be seen as a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of the Persians as a group? Architectural historians seem to have a positive response and to be receptive to such ideas, where monuments become the locus of memory for a people. This idea can be further seen in what is called architectural memory where memory imprints images onto building forms and provokes deliberate attempt at recollection. What I'm trying to say again is that Persepolis was and became part of this collective Persianate memory in antiquity. As it has been pointed out, architecture is part of the social history of humanity and it can be associated with events, places, people, and ideas. With this in mind, we can now look at the environment of Persepolis Parse and those who chose to stick around and built near the monument palace and or marked it with inscriptions, graffiti, and other devices. Of course, one is first and foremost directed to the Frataraka uh, temple or palace, which has been the subject of, of much more intense studies in the 21st century, I would say late, late 20th, early 21st century, uh, with the works of prayer Francesco Calieri and Daniel Potts, among others, in interpreting the site. Uh, this work has been followed by Gondet Mohammad Khani and Askari Chaver. These archaeological surveys more recently of the site and the new finds, and you could see I'm not a, uh, So we're talking about the Fratarka temple in relation to Persepolis. This proposed Alexandrian site of habitation northwest of Persepolis also yielded plaques of Zeus, Megistos, Apollo, Helios, Artemis, Athena, Basileia. Um, our understanding of what is called this period of post-Alexandrian uh, Persis, the dark ages of Persian history, of course, has been uh, first illuminated by the work of Josef Wieselhofer, who has laid the groundwork for understanding the history of Persis in the post-Alexandrian period and his view of the relations between the Fratarakas and the Seleucid overlords have been the foundation of subsequent studies. However, since his initial work, there has been modifications to his view and image and relation between the Frataraka and the Seleucids. One may posit the idea that while there, are an, there was only a single literary report of an uprising in Persis during the Seleucid period, or a major one, the Persians could display their resistance more symbolically and locally, for example, through the coinage. Alexandrian and Seleucid overstrikes by the Fratarika is one of the ways of a more outwardly manifestation of resistance against the conquerors. So there is a, a Seleucid overstrike and this one, um, well, I'll show you the other one, the Alexandrian one. But the manifestation of resistance against the conquerors can be even more clearly shown in the coin of Vahvars which Klosa and Musler and uh, Professor Shai Gan have also touched upon in their study of numismatics and history of the period. Not only the overstrike of Alexander coinage by Baidad, and this is a Zuhurian collection, uh, that you could clearly see this overstrike of the Frataraka and the uh, coinage of Alexander by Baidad, may be an indication of resistance and disdain for the conquerors, at least for the local population in Persis. But also the symbols, uh, also the symbolic connections with the Achaemenid kings and the copying of their poses and their gestures, the throne, the staff, are indicative of this connection to the Persian past. I don't need to point to this very much. The Frataraka coinage provides more opportunity in showing their reverence for Persepolis, if that on the coinage is Persepolis. I do understand of the differing opinions. Facing it in both palace architecture and in inscription. And of course, the title of the Frataraka of the gods. And let me just go back. Yeah, Frataraka or governor of the lords, uh, which may be referring to gods uh, uh, which resided in the temple, the Greeks that I've mentioned 
or uh, it may be referring to uh, others, such as Ahura Mazda and Mithra, which we find during the time of Artaxerxes III at Persepolis, or it simply it could be a deification of the Achaemenid kings by the Fratarikas, as in the Hellenistic period, Alexander and the Seleucids after their death were done. Um, if one wanted to take this memory of the past further, one could view the use of what Abdi Young has, uh, the title of an important essay that he has written, The Cultic Banner, which appears on the Fratarika coinage. While banners, drafts, uh, can be religious or military in usage, for the coinage, one should opt for a cultic royal banner, I think, here. On the Fratarika coin, while facing Persepolis, uh, or sitting on the Achaemenid throne on this one you're seeing, the cultic banner is clearly displayed. How else can one interpret an upright banner? And it keeps reminding me of the sort of the Avesan and the Iranian tradition of Uldrafsh, upright banner, with an upright tiara of the Fratarika, except promoting a sense of independence and resistance. Another observation is that in time when Persepolis became identified with uh, the Kianid rulers, this is in the late Sasanian period, the banner itself also became part of Kianid memorialization and came to symbolize the Kianid banner, the Rafsha Kavyani. And that, of course, this period is not clear. It's interesting that even today in Iran, uh, this banner is being propped up as part of a nationalist um, uh, discourse and resistance against the um, reigning government. Uh, the banner with tassels, and later on during the rule of the Persis kings, uh, has an eagle attached to it. And this is not the best Persis coinage, but you still you could see it. It is, in a way, reminiscent of the late Achaemenid banners. I was speaking with a friend who had just visited the Pompeii mosaics of Darius III, and we were talking of banners. In late antiquity, Persepolis, it seems, was important enough that Shapur, the brother of Ardeshi, the founder of the Sasanian dynasty, stopped at during his planned war and through divine intervention met his death there. So now people keep on stopping there. It was only then that Ardeshi, the founder of the Sasanian dynasty, was able to make, to take his proper seat as king, thanks to the intervention of Persepolis, if we want to read it as such. And this is the Tabari citation, which I'm not reading, so I'm just letting you uh, look at that and read it yourself. Uh, with the Sasanians, we are again privy to further attention and interest to this structure, that is Persepolis, as a great monument and place of respect for those who built it. Shah Pura Sagan Shah in the fourth century, on his way back from Persis to the east, stopped there. And at his instigation, a ritual or ceremony took place at Persepolis, and uh, this place there at least called Stat Sutun, 100 columns, and he praised those who built this monument. It is clear that he does not mention the Achaemenids by name, but the building itself appears to be part of an important lore. How did the later Sasanians think of Persepolis, and with whom did they associate it with? We just had in the previous uh, lecture about uh, speaking about the Huns and the Heftalites. As mentioned in the outset, invasions and incursions from outside bring about reaction and reinvocation and reinvention of the past. One can suggest, for example, that in the post hunnic invasion of the fifth century that was just discussed uh, with Procopius, as Michael Rolfe has also mentioned early on in his work on Persepolitan echoes in Sasanian architecture, may very well uh, could have been identified with the Kianids, uh, that is, these of Western uh, uh, dynasty. What can be called a national awareness could have been triggered by such an attack from the East, and hence the Iranians and the Persians. Uh, uh, I'm saying, search into the remote past, aided by the codification of the Avesta and the sacred history, and associate Persepolis with the great Kionid rulers. And in this scheme, obviously, Alexander then becomes a Roman, a Horomaic, that has been written much about, um, and so on. 
In this new history, Persepolis became Takht Jamshid, obviously, that is Jam or Yima's throne, as is, was known uh, until recently, and even by many still today, associated with the primordial king and culture hero. As a new vision of the past made the monumental monuments and structures of the old within the empire to take on a new meaning and significance. Now, not so much with the Achaemenids anymore, but with the great ancestors and the Avesta. Uh, uh, Richard Payne, but uh, also Matthew Canepa, among others, have discussed how invasions from the East brought about the manipulation of cultural memory and renaming of monuments with the new vision of the past. As memory changed, the monuments associated with this new past became such as Persepolis continued in its importance but in a different light. How would one associate Persepolis Parsa with Yima Jam, or Yima's throne, is to my mind rather simple, in that those who were aware of the Videvdad, Vendidad, Avestan tradition, book two, that, at, uh, that of Jam or Yima, with the building of a vara, an enclosure, and loading of pairs of every animals and good creatures, could have mapped it onto the Apadana relief of Persepolis, where there were possessions of the people who came to pay their taxes in reality to the king of kings. I had the uh, privilege of one night being able to stay overnight there by myself. And as I was watching these monuments, I was thinking, you know, how would people read this in late antiquity? If I knew the Avesta, the first thing I would think of actually of the story of Jam Yima and the Avesta boarding uh, pairs of people onto the, uh, on the, uh, in the Svara. In late antiquity, Persepolis was so important in the imagination of the Zoroastrians that it became an eschatological center. In the Zoroastrian Middle Persian literature, the epiphany of Zoroastrian savior appears at Yams or Yima's Vara. The location of this appearance is identified at the middle of the province of Pars, under the sacred mountain of Persepolis. In the end times, Sushyans, the savior, shall appear from underneath Persepolis and save humanity from evil. In conclusion, I would like to return to the Arsakid period, which I did not discuss very much at all, and the site of Persepolis. At the southeast building, which used to be called the harem, Ali has warned me about this, there are a number of graffiti on the facade and inside the building. And I apologize for the pictures, but that's the best I could photograph when I, many moons ago. There have been the opportunity for me to visit them a number of times and think about their significance. I've always wondered why Sasanians, uh, who, uh, whom from the very beginning created monumental rock reliefs and minted artistically superior coinage would, ha would be thought to have made incisions into the walls of Persepolis. This is the common uh, opinion, at least, uh, that this is sort of a late part, early Sasanian or late Parthian um, uh, per Persian endeavor. Having discussed these matters many years ago, again with my friends, so I put myself in there when I was much younger, with Judith Lerner, whose back is to us, with her scarf, and Shorgur has Jew. Now, I believe that they may belong to an earlier period between the second and the first century BCE. That is, uh, yeah. it is interesting that around the graffiti, there are a number of Aramaic inscriptions as well, which are not memorials of modern travelers, except I have to, uh, I'm not an expert, so I'm talking about these, and there were several of these. But there are different forms, at least from uh, what we saw on the door jams, on the facade, and inside the building. Uh, but maybe, at least I think, are contemporaneous with the kings of Persis as to whom the imageries may be portraying, who left their marks on Persepolis as such, I would suggest one of the Daras, either the Dara the first, but more importantly, Dara the second. Darai not only was part of a whole new dynasty in the area, whom uh, Professor Shaigan has called the Darayanids, but uh, to follow Shervo, uh, who has made a number of observations on the coins of the Darayanids, 
uh, has stated that there were changes, uh, not only um, in terms of uh, the script, uh, but also he suggests that there were, it seems there were changes on the fire altar structure. That means there were reforms of religion and linguistic manners. Uh, I think with Chayagan's sub-dynasty that he has put forth for the Doraya, and it's in the Persis, uh, to my mind makes the graffiti at Persepolis uh, associated with that dynasty. And that is the only contribution that I may give. And here's inside the building which I photographed, and here's the coinage of Dara the second. Again, that may not be the you know, smoking gun, but at least to my mind, this is even closer than what we think of early Sasanians than um, than it's been thought. These important changes by Dara the first and second may have caused his invocation, obviously, in the Middle Persian and Persian texts in the ambiguous period of Daraya Darayan, which has been also touched upon by Shervo and others. That is the conflation of the memory of the Achaemenid Dariuses and Daraya Darayan, Darai first and Darai second. The possible Darayanid graffiti may be a further indication of memorialization of Persepolis by the kings of Persis, thus a continuous contact by the local rulers of Persis with Persepolis. That is from the time of the Frataraka, when they established themselves and became the repository of ancient Persian tradition associated with the Achaemenids, a continuous tradition of the veneration of Persepolis state. Thank you. <laughs>